Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for coming. I'm Jada Reese. I'm the consultant editor for Flint Books. Um, and we're really delighted to welcome you to the launch of Polly Higgins's Dare to be Great, which goes on general sale at the end of this week. Flint Books is a new general nonfiction imprint um, for the History Press, which is a vibrant independent publisher based at the heart of Gloucestershire. The idea behind Flint was to create a list of books that spark debate, action, awareness, um, and conversation. So it was that kind of Polly's book chimed at a moment where all of this was coming together and kind of came full circle actually from a conversation in London um, all the way back to uh, Stroud, um, Polly's much beloved Stroud. Um, uh, to me, um, at a time when I just come out of working on a number of kind of major projects around the circular economy and the climate crisis. And it was at that time that Laura Perhenik, who's the publishing director at the History Press, also approached me um, to commission this list for Flint, for Flint. And it sort of suddenly felt like all of these things had aligned together in a very poly like way um, to kind of present me with a kind of choice point uh, where I was kind of aligning the things that I really cared about with an opportunity to kind of put more purpose into the work that I was doing and actually it was almost as though Polly's was the voice that I really needed at a time when I'd been working on a lot of things that perhaps I hadn't quite found what actually how to help myself through some of those conversations and Polly very much became that voice for me and I think it's been an immense privilege to be able to work on that voice and to be able to bring it to a much wider audience for the first time as Polly previously had only privately published this book and sort of hand sold it at some of her events so I feel really excited that a lot of other people are going to have that support that um, I definitely found um, by reading uh, Polly's work and I'm really delighted to be able to kind of pass you over to Jojo, who's Polly's kind of was Polly's closest friend and the co-founder of Stop Ecoside. And she's going to be able to talk a little bit more about what Polly really meant about daring to be great and aligning that sense of value and purpose in the world. So, yeah, this has been um, quite an extraordinary timing for for all of this. Um, and if, if any of you are familiar with Polly and her work, um, you'll know, of course, that she's no longer with us, that she passed away just almost exactly a year ago um, on Easter Day last year. Um, and when she wrote this book was around the time I first started working with her um, in 2014. That's when she was actually launching her original self-published version. Um, and there's something that is sort of quintessentially encapsulates um, for me about Polly, um, and that's that she, was, or she always encouraged people to find what it was that made their heart sing. Um, and, and that was, you know, that was kind of at the core of, you know, what she was really challenging people when she was saying, you know, dare to be great. It was actually in the first instance, it was about looking inside and seeing, you know, what is it that I actually, that really matters to me? What is the thing that really matters to me? What is the thing that really excites me that really makes me, you know, feel like I'm committed when I'm doing it and really enjoying it? Um, and, you know, the phrase she always used for that was, was what makes your heart sing. Um, and this is a, a book that's a bit of a sidestep from her previous uh, publications, which, as you, you may know, were legal. So eradicating ecocide that talked about um, bringing in a law of ecocide um, and then she went on to write something called earth is our business looking at the you know how the commercial world might approach this um, and so this was a bit of a departure and it, it kind of came from the realization that it's when we're all sort of standing in our best selves that you know real change and difference starts to happen in the world um, in a positive way and she, she made this kind of link with this book between the inner and outer worlds. So she was dealing, obviously, in the external world, she was dealing with something very um, kind of at a high level, sort of international diplomatic level, really, um, it, trying to bring in this law of ecocide and you know, encouraging awareness of that and promotion of that internationally. 
Um, but also what she, she, she often referred to what she called inner ecocides. So, you know, what, what might be going on internally that might prevent us from moving forward or from, from, you know, developing, you know, what, what's really going to make our hearts sing and to actually having, having that have an impact in the world. So that, that was her, um, you know, that, that was what she did with this book, which is quite unusual. It kind of, you know, it, it kind of brings what many people might consider a bit of a, a dry intellectual subject, which is law. Although, to be honest, Polly was never dry and intellectual about it. Um, and, you know, and this, you know, the, the much more internal sort of psychological work, if you like. And she was always a, she was actually a lawyer. She was a very extremely accomplished lawyer who stepped out of a legal career to follow um, what she felt was, you know, her true purpose, which was actually to represent the earth and to work out a way of protecting the earth legally. Um, she also realised that the ways that, you know, that, that the earth had been, you know, that this had been approached sort of legally and environmentally had not been working. And so there was this way that she was, in a sense, forced to think outside the box and to be creative with it. And, you know, she realised that this was something that meant that she had to kind of take a step back from the kinds of adversarial contexts that are you know completely standard in law i mean law is absolutely an adversarial uh, context isn't it it's it's um you know it, it's all about winning a case or losing a case um and so that's quite um i think she found that actually quite uh limiting when she was in her career as a barrister and she, she had a much more expansive view of what the potential of law was. So being creative with law is quite an unusual thing. You know, she didn't see it as something that as, as, you know, many lawyers often do. And, you know, understandably, they're trained to win a case in the courtroom. So they're trained to act within the parameters that exist to prove a certain point and to get to a certain place. Whereas what Polly was trying to do was actually expand that framework. Um, and so the the ways that she that she approached that were very very creative um and what she realized was that that meant kind of stepping outside personal boundaries and what she found was that when we do find those blocks in the external world there's often something internal that is reflected there so um and you know i, I also found this when i worked with her is that you know if we got to a point where something was stuck and it wasn't moving you know it's like how comes this is not you know, creating the response that, that you know, that we're expecting, you know, how, why, why is this not moving forward? And we would often find that there was something, you know, that was either existed between us or in our own psyche that was preventing that moving forward. There was something that we needed to actually just look at and, you know, literally from a more sort of psychological perspective and go, okay, you know, what's my block on this? Um, and actually realizing that that could liberate, you know, real world, you know, sort of progress. So that's, that was quite, um, you know, that's quite a, an unusual and creative way of working, particularly, you know, in, in, in an arena like law. Um, and I think the other thing that, that it's really worth um, noting about this book is it's, it feels very close to speaking with Polly. You know, again, unlike the more legal texts, um, it's, it's kind of, it's got a playful quality to it. Um, it's got a quite a conversational quality to it. Um, and it, it ha kind of has this sense that the book itself is almost like having an empowering conversation with her because she had this extraordinary effect on people. Um, I mean, I know I could reel off a dozen people who, ha you know, after a conversation with Polly, you know, their, their life would sort of change direction, you know, and it would inevitably change direction into the direction that they felt they had been meant to be going. <laughs> You know, there was this, there was something very deeply encouraging and empowering about her way with people. Um, and there's something of that quality, I think, that comes through in this text. Um, and she had a way of, there, there was something, it was a very particular ability that she had, actually, which was to enable people to feel safe while examining their own beliefs. So, you know, I mean, I had stories of, you know, her you know having a conversation with somebody who had started off from the kind of polar opposite position and she would never confront them directly you know it would never be a you know an argument um i mean one one example was a, a chap who was from a a chinese energy company who asked her about fracking because he 
his company were about to go into fracking. That's what they were going to do. And he just heard her talk about ecocides. He said, you know, well, is, is, is fracking an ecocide? And rather than doing what I personally, for example, having come from an activist background, I would have said, well, yes, <laughs> um, Polly didn't do that. She said, um, I'm not an expert, but I'll tell you about my experience when I visited um, uh, Dakota and Northern Montana and saw what it was like in the areas where fracking has been taking place. And she gave him a bit of a, a, a description of how that, you know, what that was like. And she said, you know, obviously if fracking's safe, you know, fine. Um, but I'm just letting you know what my experience is and you can make up your own mind. And this guy came back to her half an hour later and said, I'm going to go back to my company and tell them to go into solar. You know, so it was just, you know, it was just a kind of example of how, you know, she didn't, put this guy's back up at all but the, you know this is it's kind of a it's always stayed with me as a very classic example of the the way that she had with people um that that somehow enabled them to sometimes literally do a complete u-turn <laughs> um in, in 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 the direction they were going um but to feel supported and to feel respected in doing so um and so that was you know quite an extraordinary quality i mean the other thing that i think is is really worth saying about polly and about this book and how it encourages one is it's kind of one when when you kind of find that thing that makes your heart sing that purpose and for her that was about legally protecting the earth it's also about you know not giving up it's about really going for it it's about stepping outside you know your comfort zone potentially in the service of that purpose and that was something she unequivocally did. Um, she had an extraordinary single-mindedness. Um, she, you know, she, she lived and breathed ecocide law and bringing it about. That was her life. Um, and so, you know, there, there was this, this sort of sense that with that level of focus and with that level of willingness to keep putting aside whatever might be psychologically getting in the way was, you know, was really sort of deeply characteristic of... Polly and her way of being. Um, I, I recall once um, uh, someone in Stroud saying, oh, well, you know, we're having a little do on Friday night, you know, come along, you know, park Ecoside Law at the door and, you know, come and have some fun. And I just thought, you have no idea who you're dealing with. <laughs> you know, and, but it wasn't like it. She didn't think of it as work. You know, for her, that was passion. That was purpose. Um, and so that was, that was kind of part of who she was. So there's, there's this sense of kind of, you know, also of kind of identifying something about who you really are in, in, in how you identify, you know, what your purpose is. And I think it's also very pertinent that this book is coming out right now. Um, you know, I mean, in this extraordinary global situation that we have um, where we're all, to a certain extent, isolated, um, which is you know, difficult for some, of course. Um, and there's, you know, a lot of people are vulnerable. But there is also the sense that because we're isolated, we have this moment, this pause to do some of that internal questioning and looking at, you know, what it is that, you know, that we, that we care, that we really care about. You know, what is it when we, when we come out of this, what is going to be making our hearts sing? Um, so it's, it's, you know, it's that opportunity to look at those, those internal ecocides. Um, but it's also more sort of globally speaking, you know, it's an opportunity to, to actually change what has been business as usual. I mean, you know, it's already extraordinary how far we've come in a year in terms of Polly's campaign that she, you know, that she dedicated the last 10 years of her life to, you know, that we're now in a position where that conversation has moved on to a state level where there are governments actually calling for consideration of ecocide law, which we couldn't, I mean, Polly and I couldn't have imagined a year ago that we'd be this far. Um, but also, could any of us have imagined a situation where, you know, the majority of airlines are grounded and, you know, the, 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 the kind of business, the first world business has in many aspects, you know, come to a pause or come to, to a halt. Um, and that's not in any way to, um, to downplay how incredibly difficult this must be for many, many people across the world and how in many countries, the kinds of suffering that we're experiencing at all socioeconomic levels in the first world are experienced all the time in many parts of the world in terms of concern for loved ones, in terms of, you know, fear of hunger, in terms of, you know, fear of not having enough, all of those things. But there is, because this is so incredibly global in terms of the effects of what's been happening in the coronavirus situation, I think there is this opportunity to reconsider business as usual. 
Um, and so again, it feels very timely to be bringing out this book, which which conveys so well both you know the sort of personal side, but also you know Polly's particular mission, which is obviously about legally protecting the earth. And and there is this potential opportunity. You know, at times like this. Um, it is possible to look at baseline rules in a way that might have seemed politically very difficult, um, but but suddenly these things can become possible. So that's um, and and you know, Polly would have I think seen it this way. I mean, I I can't speak for what she would have said exactly about the the, the, the pandemic, but I certainly know what her attitude was and. It, it would have been something towards, you know, how do we, how does this moment, how can this moment contribute to creating a new framework, creating a new framework that actually gives space to move through to uh, a more beautiful world, um, as Charles Eisenstein calls it, the, the more beautiful world our hearts know is possible. Um, and, you know, that was, a, that was a world that Polly herself kind of envisaged. And actually, there's a little passage in the book where she talks about the kind of world that she wants to see in place. Um, so, you know, for me, this moment is very much about, you know, uh, looking at how, you know, how do we, how do we approach, you know, changing that legal framework and using this moment to, you know, make that heard and make that part really serious part of the discussion. I think that's probably about as much as I should say before allowing further questions, but thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> thank you, JJ, that was really helpful. It was nice to actually get an insight into what it's like, um, you know, to have kind of work with Polly and, and I obviously never had that opportunity to meet her, but your, you know, her voice, as you said, kind of comes so clearly through this book. Um, we have quite a few questions that have come through, so I'm going to just launch a couple of those at you first before perhaps opening up the floor to people to ask them directly themselves. Um, one which I think might be quite helpful for people who haven't yet had a chance to read the book and perhaps don't know that much about Polly herself um, is what was it that sparked Polly's journey? Like, you know, what was that moment of kind of realisation? Yeah, it was it was really a kind of epiphany moment for her. It really was a particular moment. I mean, she had um, just sort of launched herself into a barrister's career um, in the early noughties, 2000s. Um, and she was doing very well. She was gaining a reputation for, you know, being a formidable um, courtroom advocate. And it was the end of a long trial. She was at the Royal Courts of Justice in London. And she'd been representing someone in an employment tribunal, I believe. And yeah, this case, she'd just won this case, basically. Um, she just has been completing this case. And she looked out over London through one of the windows. And, and she just had this moment where she was looking out over the landscape, obviously a townscape at the time, and thinking, it's not just my clients that need representation, it's the earth. You know, the earth is in need of a good lawyer. And this kind of, you know, sort of triggered this kind of, it was kind of a light bulb moment for her, really. And it led her to this question, how do we create a legal duty of care for the earth? And that kind of sort of that, that was actually to guide that guide her really for the rest of her life. I mean, she, uh, the first part of the journey took her via rights of nature, which is now quite a, a, a forceful global movement um, to um, attribute legal subject status to nature. So, for example, the Wanganui River in New Zealand, there are certain there's rivers in Bangladesh as well, I believe, in India um, and parts of forest in Colombia that have been assigned legal status. And that's starting to become. Uh, you know, more acceptable, um, and it's starting to become used in the courts in certain countries. Um, and there's now quite a wide movement for that. And she was quite involved with that at the beginning. Um, the declaration that uh, Bolivia did for the uh, Declaration of Mother Earth Rights back in 2010, I believe. Um, and, but what I think what happened, what, what happened with Polly's sort of shift of focus was that she realized that the rights of nature were kind of one side of a coin and that the other side was about responsibilities and that that comes with criminal law so if you have um you know your right to life is protected by the fact that it's a crime to kill you um otherwise it's not very well protected right <laughs> um and so for her that's why she moved to this concept to the to the criminal law side that's why she you know that was came with her realization that actually this needs to be outlawed um and that's what's going to create the genuine protection so so that was kind of the the, the sort of sequence of, of of how she moved in that direction and um, i'm going to ask you another kind of general question that's sort of a bit more pertinent to the beginning of polly's journey and your own journey um obviously 
the title Dare to be Great sets up quite a big challenge, but also quite a kind of mystery. Like what, what do we mean by greatness and what does that concept of greatness mean to you personally? And how did that interplay between you and Polly inspire you, your own definition of it? Gosh, yeah. I mean, it's 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 a really interesting one. I mean, you know, the way she describes it is that you know, it's not something you 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 know go buy at the store or you know win with a particular award or anything like that. Um, that it's it's about. Um, I mean, I think for her, very much, it was about connecting with what she called her innate. You know, as a sort of she was she actually did work very intuitively, um, and so there's something about connecting to that that um, inner purpose and expressing that in the world that kind of allowed you to to sort of bring out your best and to be the best that you can be and to 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 sort of shine in your own particular greatness i mean it's actually quite um you know it's quite a it, it's a word that has a certain amount of risk associated with it these days to use um because you know there's all this that you know there's there's discourse around about, I mean, you think about Trump and Johnson, you know, make America great, make Britain great again. You know, what do they mean by that? It's certainly, I promise you, wasn't the same thing that Polly meant. Um, but um, but it's, it's, it's interesting to kind of, you know, bring that, that kind of quality back to the self and back to what that means in terms of, you know, expressing oneself. Um, and it's kind of, for me, I suppose it means something like, you know, the fullest expression of what we feel we're here for. You know, we, I think we all ask ourselves at some point what we're here for. And my starting point for that, you know, if anyone were to <laughs> say, you know, where would I start? You know, I would, I would say, you know, I, I wouldn't necessarily phrase it the same way as, 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 you know, Polly would say, but you know, what makes your heart thing is heart sing. It's kind of, you know, what is it that you love doing? What is it that gives you that joy and excitement and that passion? And how can that be applied in the real world? you know, in a way that makes a difference for others, in a way that makes a difference to the world and has you fully express yourself. You know, that I suppose to me is ultimately what, what Polly means by greatness. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, um, it's kind of a, it's kind of a challenge. <laughs> and I, I mean, I remember when I first came across her, um, I was actually through reading an article about her and I remember thinking, wow, that sounds like the biggest game in town. I'd love to work on that. And <laughs> <laughs> you know so in a sense you could see that was sort of you know it was actually a couple of years later that we actually met but you know it's almost like that little seed was was planted at that point and I think that you're right you know that when you talk about that you know the kind of word itself and the different connotations around it and how that feels when somebody asks you to dare to be great comes with it a sort of a sense of oh okay uh, can I do this? And also, how would that work? And we've had quite an interesting question from Caroline Harris, who has uh, been quite a, a, a big supporter of this book, kind of from afar, um, to her husband, Clive Wilson. And she's asked, if we find a purpose but are not in a position to make it essential to our lives, as you have said, Polly did, what does Polly in the book suggest we do? And I think that's a question we all ask ourselves is we want to dare to be, we want to do more, but how do we do that in the lives that we actually live in a meaningful mm. way? Mm. I think that's a really good question. And I think it, it also comes back to what, what's interesting is it does come back to, um, you know, where we find, I mean, because of, I mean, often what we, it's not always, but often what we, what we love doing is something that we do and love doing and are therefore have a certain degree of, of skill at it might not be the thing we earn our money with but it's you know it's, it's often something that you know we, we have a passion about um i mean i think in polly's case you know it was something that actually was within her her remit of what her own expertise was and she would have you know her, her i think her you know her kind of sense was you know you was sort of you would ground ourselves in what our skills are and look at how we you know how do we bring potentially what we do in our lives already together with that um, and you know how do we, how do we look at those approaches and if it's not something that we can you know that we are actually able to you know not everybody uh, we, I, mean, I wouldn't at, at any point say to somebody you know go quit your job and follow a dream you know in, in a kind of irresponsible kind of way and I don't think that's how Polly intended it I think what she meant is 
something more like, you know, identifying what it is that, you know, that makes your heart sing and thinking about how that, you know, how does that relate? What can I discern about, you know, where my skills are and how I can link those things together? You know, because that's actually ultimately what, what she did. She was linking her particular skills with what she felt her purpose was, which was actually, in fact, she, if you asked her to describe it, she probably would have said to bring peace, which is interesting. You know, that she, she felt herself to be, you know, she actually felt ecocide law to be a particular, almost a particular bridge or a passcode towards a world in which peace was possible. Because she was also, and, and, and so, so there was this sort of application of that calling to the legal world in which she worked. Um, because, I mean, you know, it may, it may seem obvious, but, you know, she, she often sort of drew this circle, which she called like a vicious circle, where, you know, the, there's, you know, resource conflict is actually one of the key causes of conflict in the world. And that inevitably, in, in, in the current business practices, involves ecocide, involves destruction of ecosystems. And so she was, she was looking at that cycle going, okay, so there's extracting resources, then there's, you know, what happens with those resources, then there's the people who are deprived of those resources, then there's a conflict that evolves. And then, you know, so the, the thing that's preventing the peace is the destruction of the environment. So she kind of traced that back. Um, and so, yeah, so there's this kind of, and, 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 and don't get me wrong, this is not something that I think either Polly or anybody expects people to necessarily do overnight. She had her epiphany moment, sure, but it, you know, it took her several years to come to ecocide law is the thing. And then it took her several more, <laughs> you know, to, to really, you know, persist in bringing this concept out there. Um, and it, you know, it wasn't always easy. You know, there were challenges along the way. And I think that's one of the things that she also brings out in the book. Um, you know, that, that it's not, it's not necessarily the easiest road, but it's the one that's somehow most fulfilling and most meaningful. Yeah, uh, absolutely. We've got quite a few other questions on the chat. So I've unmuted people. And if you would like to ask a question um, directly to Jojo now, please do. Hi, Jojo, it's Katie here. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Um, Jojo, I know that you can't speak for Polly, but I'm really interested to know what you think she would be um, saying during the pandemic and take away the sort of the pandemic um, side of things, but actually sort of looking at the impact, it's, the positive impact it's already had on the environment. You know, if, for example, she had been asked to write an opinion piece or something about how we can um, continue our lives after this period to, 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 to help or to keep those benefits in place. What, what do you think she would be saying or encouraging? What's the conversation she would be having? If you can, if you feel you can say, answer that. Yes, I think, um, I, I mean, as you say, obviously, I don't know exactly what she, she would have said, but I do, I do know how, um, I do know what her attitude was. And I do know that we've all, you know, many of us have seen, and uh, uh, seen nature in some ways start to regenerate. Yeah. So, so, there in, inevitably you know we are seeing a sort of pause in the destructive activities and i think you know <laughs> she would probably be saying look look what you know potentially we could do um if we put our minds to it um and you know can we start looking at different ways of doing things that will actually you know enable this this drop in pollution to continue i mean there's been so many different opinions about this you know obviously worldwide on the media um about whether this is actually you know whether this is something that we can somehow take forward or whether this is just you know it's all going to come back worse than before you know there's, there's all you know i mean i think the number of voices that we're all hearing from many many different directions are hugely confusing but i think um I think what she would absolutely have done is said, look, you know, this is a moment to look at what is possible because she was always about what is possible. Um, and actually, if you read her little vision, you know, for the future, you know, it, it had, you know, transport without fossil fuels, you know, it had, um, you know, much more community, you know, sort of communal energy sources. It had, you know, all these, a lot of things that, you know, that are ideas that are already around, that are already possible, um, but that are simply not getting the, um, the precedence or the political will or subsidization behind them in order to to move forward um and so you know there is this this um you know key issue of of political will and there is this key moment right now to potentially be able to seize that political will and to and also a, a sense you know of community that is 
emerging in many, many places locally um, of kind of mutual support. Certainly in, you know, I mean, I'm in a sense, I'm speaking for first world countries here because I am very aware that there's a huge contrast here because if you go somewhere like India, somewhere like Kenya, I don't know, these places where the, the, it's fine for you know, those in power to say everybody stop and isolate, but when you've got 90% of a population that don't have the support that we might have in, in, in the wealthy first world, then that's a very, very different story. So I think, you know, we do have to sort of keep a, an awareness of that. Um, but at the same time, you know, there is this sense that, you know, now is a possibility for big change. Of course, there's also, there are always dangers associated with that. I mean, we're already seeing in the UK a, a sort of level of civil, civil liberty suppression, um, you know, which is unprecedented. Um, and, and it, you know, so, so there's, you know, these, these things can cut both ways. Um, and, and actually, it's these moments that become very important that we just don't simply allow um, more sort of oppressive forms of government or approaches to come in, you know, during the moments where there's a kind of opening for change. So I think that, yeah. you know, Polly would be kind of saying, seize this with both hands, you know, really seize this with both hands and say, you know, I mean, for her, it would be about ecocide law. I mean, it, this is what we've just, we just made a little video last week. You'll probably see it on our social media today if you haven't already. But, you know, it's really talking about how ecocide law needs to be a key part of the discussion of how we don't go back to business as usual. And I think absolutely that is one of the things Polly's, Polly would be saying, yeah. And having the sort of, you know, because everyone obviously, the sort of necessary and very real anxiety to get back with the economy, mm -hmm. to, to have a clear voice that says, you know, what we need to keep in terms of the environment and, and how we need to remain conscious of that and get that balance, I suppose, as well. Absolutely. And I, and I think... Um, What's, what's, so, what's so particularly important about um, you know, the sort of criminal law aspect is the fact that it, it, it has such a profound effect on you know, business practice. And it's something that, you know, and there's a reason also why Polly always went for the International Criminal Court, while, why she always intended it to be an international law, rather than pushing it at any individual national level. Because as you can imagine, probably particularly now, but, but anyway, individual governments find it very scary the idea of bringing in a law like this particularly if it was to happen very fast because it, they'd feel it would put them at an economic disadvantage whereas if it's done at an, at an international level it's done at the international criminal court firstly there's a, a set quite straightforward procedure um, and secondly um, it's it's much lower political risk so, you know, if you know, as a country, as a state, if you know that for this to go forward, it requires, you know, two thirds of the members of the International Criminal Court for it to actually come into place, then you know that there's a time frame, you know that what you're doing by supporting it is putting it on the horizon, you're actually creating a transition period, literally. Um, and, and that is, that is a position, you know, that, that is an arena in which, as an individual government, you can actually gain quite a lot of kudos. You can be saying, you can be seen as being the leader in taking something forward, but at the same time, you know that you're in the safety position of it won't go forward till lots of people join you. And at that point, everybody's in the same boat. And you know, you know, with the situation we're in in the world, we're not in a situation where you can say, oh, I'm not dealing with the whole, it's at your end of the boat. Um, yeah. We're all in that same boat. So, so there's something you know, quite powerful and you know, actually politically an opportunity you know, for, for countries brave enough to take Definitely. that. Definitely, yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Katie, and, and thanks, Jojo, for answering that question. Okay, so on that note that Katie raised about, obviously, you know, what this moment kind of means in terms of ecocide law, what also do you think that this book and, and Polly would sort of speak out to those who are feeling particularly vulnerable right now, afraid, um, very kind of, I mean, this is the moment that has shaken so many people's kind of baseline of what it's like to just live their lives. And for some, that's been very profound um, in terms of, you know, loss um, and family illness. For some, it's also been profound on a kind of work-life balance level, relationships, connection. Um, 
what would Polly say in terms of, you know, that this moment of, of facing those kind of inner eco sides that are really challenging us right now, do you think? Yeah, it's, a, it's, it's, wow, it's, it's quite a, an extraordinary time in that way, isn't it? It really does, you know, has kind of thrown us all back on, you know, what our, what our vulnerabilities are, and particularly those who are losing people at this time. Um, I do know that Polly always had a very much a kind of bigger picture perspective on on life and death. She and and I think one one way of coming to this would actually be, and of course this isn't in the book because she was writing it. But you know, her own passing was an extraordinary. You know, the way she approached that was an extraordinary thing in itself, in that she she kind of. She always saw, she always saw death as kind of an, a, a next chapter. And so there's something about those moments that shake us out of our comfort zones. And so many of us are outside our comfort zones right now of, of kind of seeing that as a, as you know, with compassion and always with compassion because she had this extraordinary, totally non-judgmental approach um, that I think is one of the things that really remained with people that met her. And it was this sense of, not not just it's not just about challenging yourself it's also about self-care it's about being kind to yourself as well and actually saying what do I need in this moment and of course some of those immediate needs can't be immediately met if we're not allowed to you know go hug our friends you know that that's you know that's kind of heartbreaking on 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 quite a profound level um i don't personally believe that that will go on forever uh, i think if anybody attempted to make it go on forever i think we'd very soon see people making a choice between whether they maybe got ill or whether they actually had some human contact i don't you know i i think you know that that's my personal opinion on that but but um <laughs> It's a really, you know, it's a tough one because it's really challenging us. In some ways, it's really challenging us to communicate with each other. And I think, interestingly, having to communicate online means that the actual talking part of communicating is coming more to the fore. Um, and so there's this, there's this sense that we're having to hear each other, talk one at a time <laughs> you know, in, in this way that we often associate with a kind of therapeutic situation, you know, like you go, you know, go to a therapist and, you know, you talk and then they talk and then, you know, you don't have this kind of constant talking over each other that we're so used to and that our whole culture kind of does. And actually, to be honest, my feeling is that kind of the, in terms of the, the sort of news feeds online, it feels a bit like that. It feels like everything's just coming one on top of the other. You know, it's, it's almost, you know, it's really hard to kind of keep a thread, but, um, but yeah, so this, this, there's this sense of, of actually kind of going, yeah, okay, actually I need to, I, you know, needing to converse with people who care. Um, and, 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 and obviously, I mean, this, this always, this makes me think again of the people who are doing the actual caring right now as well, you know, the health services in all the different countries that are really stretched right now. Um, and, you know, there's this, yeah, there's this way that we're having to kind of internalize that and actually think to ourselves, what do, you know, what do I need? What, what, you know, and, and also potentially, you know, why, why am I feeling what I'm feeling? And that is, that's not easy. That often not easy. You know, we all have stuff going on internally that we don't necessarily always want to look at. And, and I mean, bereavement will throw that up like nothing else, you know? Um, so I think, you know, she would, she would be kind of, <laughs> I've got, I've got a friend who, who, do, who does this when she realizes she goes, and she kisses her wrists you know I mean, it's kind of like you know it's, it's almost like you give this little moment of sort of forgiving yourself and kind of going okay I, I really needed to I needed to say that or I needed to feel that or I might have got that wrong but you know it, it, it's okay I'm still here you know I, I can I can still care about myself you know <laughs> yeah. um, and, and I think Polly would have vibed very strongly with that <laughs> Yeah, and that makes a lot of sense. I think right now that absolutely that need to forgive ourselves quite a lot is from mm. being a thing to hold on to. Um, absolutely, and actually, I'd, I mean, I'd love to add something there actually because with the with people often ask us. Um, you know, am I committing ecocide by driving my car? Now, obviously, you know, for example, you know, what are the little things that we're all doing that contribute to ecocides? You know, these are the things that we can now be, I mean, that comes a bit back to Katie's question from earlier. These are the things that we can now be thinking about. You know, what are the things that I can change, you know, in my own life? 
but also to, to, to get perspective on this as well and to say that, you know, actually, yes, I may be driving a car or maybe driving a fossil fuel car, but I'm doing that because that's what's being made available to me. And that is not something that I decided. That is something that industry lobbyists and politicians decided, you know, what's available to me. So, you know, the ecocide law is geared at that top level. You know, it's geared to go to the source of, you know, the, the business practices that end up in this, you know, in, in, in this sort of um, unhealthy consumer environment um you know because you know we, we i think we can draw a line i think actually you know um corporate pr has done an amazing job of making everybody feel guilty about where we are when actually if you look at it you know there's this there's this there's this huge kind of culture of sort of separation going on you know in our culture where you know a certain powerful few are able to treat nature and other people as something separate and to be used as a resource, you know, and, and, and actually reconnecting ourselves and saying we are actually part of nature is actually part, and it sounds odd maybe, but it's part of what criminalizing ecocide does. Because if you say that damaging nature is equivalent to damaging people, you're actually putting them on a par. You're, you're, you know, you're saying that actually, it, you know, that it matters what we do to the earth. It matters what we do to, you know, to the natural living world around us because we are an absolutely intimate part of it you know and it's, it's a completely you know it's a completely sort of different attitude and and i think um the fact that the ecocide law kind of aims you know at that top level you know at, at the level of um the, the people of superior responsibility it actually you know, there's actually this this um you know there's a chance of you know changing uh, you know corporate practices at, on the grand scale in a way that all of us between us we can help we can obviously create that demand for better ways of doing things but if you're you know if you've got your ceo sitting in there going hmm, in a few years time i'm not going to be able to do this anymore because i might end up behind bars they're going to start seriously thinking about what to do instead and believe me they will because they're going to want their business to continue you know um and and who knows what who you know who's going to come out of this as as, as the survivors but but i think you know it, it's it's important to you know to to make those distinctions to realize you know where we can make a difference and where something is as sort of um key piece as as ecocide law can make a difference i think that's a really powerful thing and actually as you're saying it's almost that sense that we we get caught up in these sort of um constant almost our own in in it ecocides about guilt and about the sense that we're you know a contributing factor and also that i think there's this kind of strange dichotomy between you know we're talking about daring to be great but with that becomes this oh well if i'm going to be great then i can't be vulnerable and actually i think that's something that comes out so much in the book there's a wonderful passage that polly talks about that resonated a lot with me as a parent where she talks about the sense that actually we we kind of grow our children up to sort of believe oh well they you know um crying is bad and you know we should learn to kind of you know be brave about things and almost we get caught up in as you were saying these messages around greatness and braveness as not being something where actually that's allowing for fragility and vulnerability and self-care um and polly talks about actually the next time a child cries over something however trivial it is just go and sit down and howl with them and see how they feel and um, i just find it my daughter the other day and she was she was totally taken aback she's like oh mommy I, I don't I don't understand but actually it was wonderful because we did exactly as Polly then said is you'll probably find that you end up giggling a lot together at the end of it and actually giving the message that to cry is okay and to be vulnerable is okay and that the two things aren't polar opposites one can be great and brave and strong and actually vulnerable and fragile and in touch with your emotions and that need for self-care all at the same time. I would actually go further. I would say that because one of the things that I noticed um, in in also working with Polly um, and, uh, you know, and still now, the real blockages, when you identify what they are, they almost always make you cry. And that's how you know that you've really hit something. That's how you know that it's something that, you know, like, oh, my God, that was the thing that was really sitting in there and not moving, you know, and actually it's 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 the tears that, that let it come out. Um, and, you know, that's you know, that doesn't mean that. You know, <laughs> next time I go and do an interview, I'm going to appear in tears. You know, it, it just means that that 
that getting through stuff actually does involve hitting those emotional places because actually how can you know that's that, those are things that have us grow those are the things that have us move through um you know and and i think you know if if you're managing to sort of you know, sit through your entire self-examination of your entire life and not get upset about anything you know either you're incredibly lucky or you're kidding yourself <laughs> yeah that's probably true and um, there's been a lovely discussion in the chat actually where chloe posted a message about it feels poignant that this message is coming from an author who is no longer here at a time when we are having to look at making things we once thought were impossible possible and andy has replied to that saying that um Friends in health are reporting being able to make big changes happen in six days that hadn't succeeded in the previous two years. Lots of learning about what we thought impossible that might no longer be. And I think that's a really powerful thing that perhaps we can take out of this current situation. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm absolutely with you on that. Um, I, th I think it's, you know, it's, it's I mean, you know, I've even heard people saying, oh gosh, I, f I feel like I wasn't really... I wasn't really I wasn't really living consciously before I was just going from day to day and you know sort of continuing on the kind of hamster wheel you know whereas suddenly all of these things are coming up to confront and you know to be to be dealt with um and I think you know I mean that whole thing that I, we were talking about before about you know the impossible becoming possible I think that is true at the personal level as well as the political level um and yeah and again I think it's you know whether we can approach that you know with with openness and with honesty you know with actually with authenticity um to to get to you know to get to a place that that actually you know that is a place of care both self-care and earth care as polly would would phrase it yeah i i agree and i think that's a really important journey is that you know sort of suffuses the entire book is that move from that self-care to earth care and that by doing that as you know both chloe and, and andy were commenting it does actually create open up those possibilities that we perhaps haven't thought were there both within ourselves and actually then our ability to make them in the wider world um i'm gonna see if there are any other questions that people would like to put either on the chat or ask directly to you and then we've got one that i'd like to finish up with so i'm just gonna again unmute everybody for a minute and see how it works hi can i yes can I yeah you're on oh hi um well, first of all, I'd just like to congratulate you, Joe, for putting all this together. It's brilliant. Um, and also to acknowledge Jojo, really, because I think we're extremely fortunate to have such a brilliant spokesperson, you know, kind of co-founder of the Ecoside, someone to, to carry on the baton. I think she's done it amazingly well. It's just, it's and uh, I, was, I was very um, I was fortunate to interview uh, Jojo a few months back actually and you came up with a great phrase Jojo I'm not sure whether you can remember this I've been trying to rack in my brains for the last 10-15 minutes but it was you were gave an example with Ecoside with um, with a Buckminster Fuller quote yes can you can you remember that yes 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 it's, it's, um, and Polly used to talk about this she said um, Ecoside law is like a trim tab um, and, and, and Buckminster Fuller used it, I think he even had it on his epitaph, call me the trim tab. Um, but a trim tab is apparently it's a small part on a large ship that when it's turned, it then turns the rudder and the rudder then turns the ship. But unless you turn that first part, you don't get that effect of turning the entire ship around. Mm. Um, and, you know, Polly always, you know, thought of Ecoside Law as, as the trim tab you know as the as the, the the sort of key piece that would create that change in direction um you know that would actually allow us to turn the planetary ship around yeah lovely image <laughs> on which note um there's been a question posted do you think it was the backing of the law and the realization that bigger change was possible that gave rise to this challenge to dare to be great so almost exactly like that kind of turning motion do you think that was kind of that moment for polly that sort of as things began to gain momentum she began to kind of think about this challenge to dare to be great to take it even further that's an interesting one actually because i would say that um you know there was certainly there was a period where 
she was coming up against um, the fact that wealthy states and big NGOs were reluctant to get behind what she was putting putting across, um, and that it was it was going you know it was kind of, there was kind of a realization I think that ultimately nothing is accomplished alone, um, but the conventional means of you know the conventional ways that people would get support for you know, campaigns or, or, or projects in the world didn't seem to be working around ecocide law it was considered too risky um, and you know there was I mean the whole dare to be great idea kind of came up on one one of her speeches she was due to be giving a speech about ecocide law and she ended up giving this speech about daring to be great, about what it was like to actually try, you know, to, to do something that stepped outside of your comfort zone. And I think that also kind of came along with this sense that, you know, what if everybody did this? How powerful would that be? You know, then that, that, that you know, that wouldn't, you know, it wouldn't be, you know, it wouldn't be just Polly. It wouldn't be, you know, the, it wouldn't be, the, an, you know, a number of kind of... I don't know, thinking of it as, as sort of avenues that appeared closed, if you like. You know, she's like, you know, once, once you actually step out of that comfort zone, she's like, you know, there was this kind of sense of, and she actually talks about it at one point, I think, in the book, where she says, you know, uh, birds aren't meant to fly alone. They, they're meant to fly in a flock. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, and so, you know, there's, there was this, I think, it, you know, it came along with this sense of, gosh, you know, what if, what if everybody, you know, actually identified their purpose in the way that, you know, she obviously felt she had. Um, it's like, how, you know, how, how could that, how would that be? You know, there was this sort of, it was very much this kind of an opening up of possibility, I think, for her around mm -hmm. that concept of what if everybody did this? <laughs> you know, so, so that, that's kind of my feeling around that. Yeah, and I, you know, I think, imagine that we would unleash a kind of, yeah, hitherto untold tap of... Uh, yeah. and, and, and I think it's, it's also what, what sort of led us, I mean, we started the Stop Ecocide campaign back in 2017, um, but, you know, it was pre in preparation for about a year and a half, and, and you know, sort of following on from when the book was published, and, it, you know, there was, it was very unusual the way that it was put together, you know, it was, it was you know, if, okay, if NGOs are not going to fund this, states are not going to fund this, it has to be crowdfunded you know how how are we going to do this um and actually kind of pulling together something that is a bit different you know that has that actually has you know when when you sign up and you donate to the stop ecocide campaign you're actually agreeing to a statement that says you know you believe that you know life has the right to you know continue in a peaceful manner and that actually to consistently disrupt that is is criminal you know there's there's, there's actually something you know it's kind of a step up from your average crowdfund um yeah. you know and it has this you know it has this added bonus for activists where you know they can they can use that document that, that, that you know that they sign when they donate um yeah. you know if, if they're arrested in, you know, and sent to court for standing up to protect the earth you know so earth defenders you know earth protectors effectively you know they can say well you know here's my primary proof you know it's actually you know legal valid document to prove that you know i'm a i'm a trustee of the earth i'm doing this to protect not to cause harm so you know there was that kind of level of creativity and out of the box thinking that that that, that polly was engaging in and the whole concept of conscientious protectors which is something that extinction rebellion have taken up and, and you know a lot of activists have taken up this concept that came from polly you know this sense that you know it's our conscience that actually you know that takes us towards you know towards doing what's right so to speak um, and doing that, even if it happens to be, you know, for not, not everybody will feel comfortable with this, but for some, you know, it can involve stepping outside the usual laws in order to highlight laws that should be there. Mm. So, yeah, yeah. I think that's really powerful. And I think that whole message about that kind of move from kind of protester to protector and mm. the two can maybe the two as you say sit alongside each other sometimes but there is a much more deeper profound when you actually step up and say i am a protector that's yeah. a really powerful statement to make and yeah you're right i think that speaks to a lot of things on so many levels both psychologically and also how we you know how we manifest and obviously probably talks a lot about that manifest within the world that kind of you know that sort of sense of kind of moving from how our being is into how our doing is in the world and actually how we, we step up and we do in the world as a manifestation of what we believe and what our values are and I think that's a really interesting thing that kind of people hopefully will take from the book is that exploration of those inner values and then how they want to translate that and manifest it into the world itself. Mm.
I have one and I think it feels quite important to ask I suppose because it seems so central to who Polly was um, and actually almost in how the book came about was this sense of rootedness that Polly clearly had and although this book speaks out on a huge international level and you can see that because of the endorsements that it's had and the forward by Marianne Williamson um, we've got you know Dr Jane Goodall um, you know with the afterword and Michael Mansfield and you know a lot of people across the spectrum of different creative to legal arts and around the world have spoken about how they've been moved by Polly and you've talked and I've actually in my own experience met people since who met Polly and had changed their whole lives because of Polly which is it's an amazing thing but she in the book has this beautiful passage where she talks about how much she gained from the strength of her community and how we all have this sense that you know we we are seeds so you have to be nurtured and that's part of the self-care and those roots and where we choose to plant ourselves and that might not necessarily be geographical it could be a planting within a community that isn't necessarily physical but for her obviously she gained a huge amount by being planted within a physical community and I wonder if you feel that sense of community which we're we're talking a lot more about now and I think feels incredibly important to this time because although we're being fractured potentially from our communities physically actually the communities within which we embed ourselves are what are keeping us going as well spiritually what do you think in terms of the importance of community moving forward both for the kind of ecological environmental movement but also for that kind of spiritual psychological development i think it's absolutely essential i think it's fundamental um and the, the, i think the, again we're seeing at the moment an, an interesting situation in terms of developing communities um both literal physical ones in in our sort of very very intimate locations of being able to may help out our neighbors and so on um but also in terms of you know what are the online communities that we can um be active in um where can our voice be heard and where do we resonate where do you know who do we resonate with um and how much we are always you know we're always stronger together um and i know that polly didn't really feel like she'd come home until she came to Stroud. Um, and she really considered her, you know, the community here to be like family. So, you know, for her that, you know, that it was very place-based in terms of that sense of, fe uh, you know, sort of feeling of coming home. But the other thing that your question makes me think of, and I think, and I obviously not everybody at this time can do this, um, but I believe in the UK, we still have permission to go exercise outside. Um, mm -hmm. But what Polly did and what I do as well, um, was every single day without fail, put her bare feet on the ground. Because, you know, she, she really strongly believed and, I, and over the years of working with her and doing this myself, I absolutely echo this, just feeling connected to the earth is actually makes a huge difference and is is hugely grounding psychologically as well um and when it comes down to it you know this this work you know, polly's work in particular and, and and my work is very much about the body of the earth it's, it's about physical material reality and health um and so something about making that physical connection is actually really powerful um and you know i think that you know as and when we're able to do that in company so much the better um but certainly you know where where we can um i would certainly say planting one's bare feet on the earth um can bring a kind of a perspective and a connection that polly was all about <laughs> And I think that's a really powerful thing. She talks in the book about calling it getting guyed, um, how she <laughs> her feet on the earth. And she talks about the wavelength, actually, of the earth. It's something I learned from the book that has always stayed with me, the kind of 7.8 hertz that the earth actually is the wavelength that the earth generates and the, the physical energy and entity that the kind of being of um, Gaia. And if you put your feet on the earth, you can actually get Gaia. And it's, I think, a really powerful thing as you say we are in a time where perhaps we can't do that you know that easily but there are ways in which maybe for some of us we can still go out and do that and bring that strength 
back into kind of our communities, whether they're, you know, still physical or virtual. Um, and I think that's really important. If there's one message that you would like to leave us with in terms of Polly and her words and the nature of Dare to be Great at this time, what would it be? Wow. How did I not know you were going to ask that question? It's one of those ones where you suddenly go, damn, I should have had a phrase right there. Um, <laughs> but um, no, I think... <clears throat> I mean, it's it's got to it's it's got to come back to really for, for for me with with Polly is about you know she would always come back to this phrase you know does it make your heart sing you know and the other one she often used is is it for the best and she talks about that in the book as well you know there's this sense that you know that we have some on some level we have this kind of innate knowledge of whether you know we might want something but we might also kind of have this innate knowledge of whether or not it's actually for the best. Um, even if we can't always explain it. So I would say, always ask what's for the best and think about or feel into what makes your heart sing. That's wonderful. And thank you. I think that's something that we can all take away, especially at the moment. Thank you all so much for coming and thank you for allowing us to record this. And JJ, thank you so much for your time and, you know, sharing the wisdom both of your own and of Polly's with us all. I think it's been a really lovely way to start the week.